Welcome again to the Comic Anthologist, and if you're tuning in for the first time, please click the subscribe button to show your support. Now, this is part two to the Strike Force Moratori comic book series that dates back to 1986 to 1991. Now, it was created by Peter B. Gillis, and it was one of the most well-written stories. It's one of those hidden gems that you would find at right. the comic book store because it was so different from everything that was out there. It just gave me the passion to just read comics in right. terms of... It was that good. It I was mean, just that good. It inspired me and inspired the both of us to read the books that we have been reading over the last several years. And it's been that particular series, well, that was one of the series that got me into writing because it was just like the character development was so good. So, oh yeah, it was so it was so, it was well, so well done. It, it was, was so well excellent. It was just one of those things that you just sat there and you, I could not wait for the issue to come out. We kept rushing up to the latest, uh, the, the yeah, nearest 7-Eleven. Uh, yeah, we were, we, were yeah. we were living in yeah. Baldwin Hills at the time and we would just go to 7-Eleven and go get the right. book. And I would read it, then he would read it, and then he would read it again, and I would read it again. So it was that, it was like, dude, we, and then eventually I had to go out and get my own stuff. In part two, we're, in this, yeah. in part two, basically when the characters got back to Earth from dealing with the loss of Marathon from exploding that ship outside of Jupiter. And adept finally succumbing to the moratorium effect. On the way back home because her power had surged to the point where because she was basically a walking living recorder and she, well not only recorder but she could adapt to any kind of like poison or any kind of weapons and or develop any, a countermeasure a to countermeasure to it. these people at the time now one thing we didn't touch upon in part one for the horde is basically the horde before they came to earth mm -hmm. they were basically found by these aliens only known as the tall ones because they really were yeah they were really uh there was really no name for them at the time, but they came to just the tall ones basically came to a planet where the horde were living on, and they were already living like barbarians or whatnot. And not only that, too, the or like they the, would just basically just rough. put it to you this way, and this is what I know about the horde: they had polluted their planet so that they were living just in squalor. They were living just to survive or whatnot, and the tall ones came in to try to help these people. They had no weapons, no ill will no bad intentions, right. and the Horde was thankful for what they had done for them. But in thanking them, they turned around and killed the tall ones and they take, murdered them. Murdered them within with weeks, blood. literally going in and blowing them away or mm -hmm. slitting their throats in the middle of the night. That unfortunately gave them access to the stars because what they did was they took the ships, didn't know how to maintain them, didn't know how to fly them, but they figured it out eventually and that's what started them on their interstellar campaign of going from planet to planet to planet, like Locust, taking all the resources from it, mm -hmm. and then eventually leave, leaving it bare waste completely. And they move on to the next planet. And what they would do for the native, native population, they would keep some of them, but then kill the rest. Slaughter, yes, exactly. They, they would slaughter the rest. Right. And they didn't think nothing of it because in their eyes, they were hunters. They were just predators mm -hmm. of the stars. They were just right. locusts. They were just basically the worst of the worst of the universe. Right. And then, like I said, they were called the Vashem. And there was one particular character yeah. that kind of, that didn't kind of, he changed the tide of the war. His name was uh, Jason Edwards. Edwards. And basically, he was a soldier that was captured by the Horde. And when he was captured, he, was, he had inadvertently had contracted a virus that basically caused a moratorium effect. It countered it. It countered it, basically. So now the characters have been able to keep their superpowers and still live past that year-long uh, death sentence. Exactly. And the thing is, this all took place when Peter B. Gillis left the book. He left the book at issue 19. So when issue 20 came in, James Hundel came in and took over the writing of the book. And it changed and shifted focus from the moratorium effect to now the characterization of the next generation that came after. Um, but getting to the point of Jason uh, Edwards, his no name was moniker was Revenge. And basically his powers were something similar to that of Gambit of the X-Men. He t could touch a particular item or object and control the atomic decay. And it basically caused the item to explode if need be. Right. And so... Um, it was, ended up becoming the most powerful member of the, what was that, the fifth generation? The fifth generation, right. Fifth generation of more. And that was, the fifth generation was the one that lived. 
Because right. there was only one left out okay. of the uh, third generation. But she was murdered by the sixth generation of Moratori, which happened to be these were serial killers. And they were commissioned by the government to silence anyone that... Because they had their own nefarious ends. The government, known as the Padia, had their own nefarious ends to further and destabilize countries and do, well, they basically the, want to further their own agenda. Because at the time, the countries had all band together as the Padia, as one nation, one world, because of the horde threat. But there were still people in power, especially with the corporations, that wanted to further their agenda to make money off of the war and keep things going the way that they wanted to go. Mm -hmm. But they figured, let's knock out and take out the strike force moratorium. The, the We're not going to get into politics, but does that sound familiar with real life? Oh, yes, it does. Yeah, because no. they basically want to further their own agenda to make sure that they stay in power. Getting back to the point, you had the serial killers, which was, one was Cambodian, his name was the ghost. Then you had them. Then you had the tiger, he was from India. And his powers are energy based. And he and could cut through anything, basically he could, with his thoughts, create an energy gauntlet and slice through anything. And, and even if it's basically, you say it's invulnerable, he found a way to cut through it. Right, exactly. And no, the wind. The wind, and the wind was a serial killer. Yeah, he went around killing homeless people. It's Native Indian descent. Native, Native, Indian, Native yes. American descent. Native American descent. And his thing was to kill as many homeless people as he could. And that's what he did. He just went around killing homeless people just because he was a sociopath. And after he was granted these powers, he ended up with super speed. The ghost ended up with super strength and able to mask, and and mask himself from any kind of recording device or any kind of camera that you saw. kind of like a human... Um, Human Chameleon. Human Chameleon or Human... Um, you know the Predator series where they have the technology where they can go ahead and just bend the light? Well, his body had the ability to bend the light wherever he went. So he, if he didn't want anybody to see him, they, could, they can't see him. And he came close to killing the doctor who created the moratorium process. He came close to fulfilling the government's agenda of killing him so that way they could continue to further their own agenda with the soldiers. But... When he found out what they had plans for the ghost, the ghost backed down and didn't and chose not to kill the doctor, and he went his own way. But not before that, he had, was sent to also kill and assassinate uh, the other members of Strike Force Moratori. Now there was Revenge, Scanner, Burn, and Lifter, and he was about to kill Lifter when Scanner and Scanner was the only one that could that see, could him. see yeah. him. Basically, that's when the two fought, and he threw him, and Lifter was able to throw him off the ship when everything went down the way it did. Once this whole story was done with the horde being taken out, because the tiger was sent to assassinate Bravo, she was the last surviving member of the third generation. Right. He succeeded by slicing her nearly damn near in half with his uh, his fists, and he and didn't care. No matter how invulnerable she was, how whatever did. thick skin she had, super strength. Because she, she had her matter. powers were basically almost like marathons. And she was one of the, of the third generation that survived because she was in contact with Jason, right. with Revenge, and she contracted the same virus that basically kept the, the mortuary effect from killing her as well. So she was starting to live her life again, taking care of herself, but the government didn't want her to do that. And they wanted her out of the way, so she was assassinated by the Titan. Then it went into a cyberpunk mode, but that was dealing with a new alien menace that helped the human race wipe out the Vasak. And they were basically called the VXX-199. And they came in and literally caused spontaneous combustions around the planet. That's why I said this one is where it starts to get a little weird. Uh, the way how it was written was that they had changed the culture of the planet. Everything fractured back to what it was. Now the corporations were running circuits. Because the Horde got wiped out. Within, oh, like, they got wiped out. Yeah, the Horde also, got their, their tails handed to them like it was no one's business. But the Horde were also tricked into going to Mars. Because Mars was terraformed by the VXX-199. And they ended up going to Mars thinking that, oh, this would be a safe haven for us. But they get down there, they ended up contracting a virus which changed them physiologically. So that way they could survive on that planet. But they never got a chance to finish that storyline. Because it stood, the book was canceled. Yes. Because the, the book was canceled at issue, what, 32? Which was called Electric, Electric Undertow. Undertow. Yeah. So, and, and that took place 10 years after the original series where Fire and Scanner had ended up becoming 
uh, a couple, and they had two children. Yeah, they got married. And, and then Jason Revenge and Lifter, they had gotten together, then they broken up. Right. They and they were dealing with fighting the VXX one nine nine, and eventually, as the series ended, we don't know what happens to the final fates of those characters. Originally, the se the series was supposed to go further and further into the future. Now that there was no having to worry about the first. Uh, Effect the moratorium, effect. but it did take away when the the the, the, J, the virus that Jason had contracted took away the the basically the, it the changed aspect. It, it changed the, the whole book. tone, of the and book. it was it wasn't the same when now you know the characters couldn't die anymore, and it was like I liked the unpredictability in the first half in the first place, but yep. then when it got to so predictable, I think that's probably maybe one of the reasons why it got canned. Well, yeah, it's one of the reasons why it got canned because also two didn't sell very well, and there was the five issue limited series. And once they were able to defeat the VXX-199, because they were able to... The VXX-199 had cloned and made their own moratory. And they were sent to kill the latest and final generation that came before them 10 years prior. And Dr. Kimo Taluma was still alive at that but point. But he was in hiding. He was in hiding because he knew that they were sending those agents to kill him and anyone that was associated with anybody that was involved with the process. You know what's one thing they didn't address to? What was that? Blackthorn's baby. No. They only went by, and that's the thing, Blackthorn, getting back to the last point of this uh, broadcast, is that Blackthorn lived long enough to have her baby. But after having, hours after having her child, mm -hmm. she has succumbed to the moratory effect mm -hmm. while her, her husband, which was Greg, not, what was it, Greg Madeline? No, not Greg Madeline. But the actor that she fell in love with she spent her final moments uh, with him and he hugged her while she was melting in his arms. Because her powers were that of melting or dis dissolving uh, molecular bonds. But then the, when the moratory effect for her kicked in, she you know, herself dissolved from that same, her same power that she was doling out on inanimate objects or horde members or whatnot. So, so her baby was able to live and we saw a touch of that in issue 13, a strike force moratory where you had the third generation versus the first and second generation mm -hmm. of Moratori when they were fighting each other. With, of course, when they thought the other two, the first and second generation, went traitor. But one of the characters by the name of Wildcard. Had the ability to absorb the Moratori power of the other teammates other around, around him. him. But he kept absorbing too many of them at one point. At one point and the Moratori effect sped up his demise from the other just by taking in all their powers all at the same almost at almost totally almost at the same too time too quickly and then the last person he absorbed his power from was from Blackthorn and he looked at Blackthorn and says I only had a few weeks I only had a few weeks and he just literally you see him turning into a pile of melted mush but you saw his moratory effect and inadvertently she saw what was going to happen to her I wonder if they cribbed that for a moment I'm just just being facetious here. I wonder if they cribbed that from the Incredible Melting Man. From well, the Incredible Melting Man, he died a little slower than this guy. This guy <laughs> died within minutes. The Incredible Melting Man took hours. He took like almost a whole 24 hours, hours before, yeah, exactly. before he succumbed. But that's a movie for another time. Then. But, 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 yeah. In any case, anyway, this but, was part two of Strike Force Moratori, and I hope you enjoyed this broadcast. And once again, to show you some support. Broadcast, podcast. Look, it's the webcast. Let's call it the webcast. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, all right. Now, to show you some support, please hit the subscribe button. And if you have any, any kind of questions whatsoever, you could reach us at thecomicanthologist at gmail.com. And this is us signing out. Till the next time. Peace.